Reversible processes are defined as those that can be reversed without leaving any trace on the surroundings. This means that both the system and its surroundings have to go back to their original states. The net heat and net work for the combination of the original process and the reverse process would have to be equal to zero. Of course, in nature there are no reversible processes. Irreversible processes are those that are not reversible, and in thermodynamics they are usually a result of any of these three things. Heat transfer through a finite temperature difference, friction, which results in heat transfer, or an unconstrained expansion of a gas to a lower pressure. The first one just means that when there's a temperature difference, and the heat spontaneously moves from the higher temperature body to the lower temperature body, that energy will most likely be irrecoverable through spontaneous means, like we went over during the first statement of the second law explanation. If we have a hot cup of coffee and the heat moves to the surrounding air as it cools down, the air is not just going to move that heat back to the coffee to bring it back to its original position. And even if we used a heat pump or other systems to bring the coffee to its original temperature, this would require some work input and the surroundings would still not go back to their original temperature. And that's true for any heat transfer due to a temperature difference, the process is irreversible. Every time there is friction between bodies, there will be heat generated, and again that energy that arises from that friction will not be recoverable. This means that friction generates heat, but that heat is lost and we cannot just use that heat to reverse the friction related action. Unconstrained expansion means that we go from a high pressure state to a lower pressure state without constraining it in any way. For example, we can have a piston cylinder device that has a mass on top of the piston. If we remove this mass, the piston will immediately go up, higher than where we took the mass off. And if we want to go back to our original state, we would have to put work into the system to bring down the piston to its original position. This means that the process is irreversible. Constrained expansion, on the other hand, is theoretically reversible. With the same example of a piston cylinder system, we can have smaller masses on top of the piston. If we take one by one, the piston will rise little by little. When the number of masses approaches infinity, with infinitesimal masses that add up to the same original mass from the irreversible example, we could have the position of each mass be exactly where the piston would rise up to. In theory, and of course with an infinite number of masses, we could just place each mass back on top of the piston, making this process completely reversible. Now, of course, having an infinite number of masses is not possible. But what this example serves as is to show that some processes are more irreversible than others, and the closer we get to an idealized reversible process, the efficiency of that process itself is going to be higher. We'll see this in just a second. A parallel example in terms of heat transfer would be to have heat go from one barely slightly higher temperature to a barely slightly lower temperature. It's still not reversible, but it somewhat makes sense to say that it would be much easier to reverse the heat transferred from a body at 20 degrees Celsius to the surroundings at 19.99 degrees Celsius than the heat transferred from 500 degrees Celsius to 10 degrees Celsius. Now if we want to make heat transfer reversible, we can just transfer heat without changing the temperature. We already know about these processes and we even have a word for them, we call them isothermal. This means that isothermal heat transfer is indeed reversible. Additionally, we can also make a distinction between totally reversible processes and internally reversible processes. We call a process internally reversible when no irreversibilities occur inside its boundaries. We can have a system that passes through the same states in one direction that it passes through in the reverse direction. So let's expand upon what I just said about efficiency. The most efficient cycle is where every process is reversible, even if just internally reversible. And let's start with the cycle that we discussed two lectures ago. Link below to it if you haven't watched it yet. The heat engine was comprised of a boiler where we add a heat from a high temperature reservoir to the working fluid, a turbine where the fluid is expanding while producing work, a condenser where heat is rejected to a low temperature reservoir, and finally a pump or a compressor that use the work that we put into them to increase the fluid's pressure. Now for this heat engine to be the most efficient it can be, we would have the processes between 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, where the heat is added and removed, be isothermal processes. Isothermal heat addition at the boiler, and isothermal heat rejection at the condenser. And, since we don't want to lose any heat to the surroundings while producing work at the turbine, 
and we don't want part of the work that we put into the pump or compressor to be lost as heat, both the expansion and the compression have to be adiabatic. When we meet all of these four conditions, this is what we call a reversible heat engine, which is also called a Carnot heat engine. Of course, because it was Carnot that established this maximum efficiency concept. A TV diagram for this heat engine cycle would look like this. From 1 to 2, we have heat coming into the fluid at a constant temperature, which makes the fluid expand. From 2 to 3, an adiabatic expansion at the turbine, meaning that the volume increases even more while the fluid loses temperature. Then from 3 to 4, the fluid loses heat and therefore volume at a constant temperature. And then from 4 to 1, adiabatic compression while gaining both pressure and temperature. Important to note here is that the work that the compressor requires can be drawn directly from the turbine. The turbine will produce enough to run the compressor and some more, which we know as net work out from the cycle. Now, we already knew that the efficiency of a heat engine was defined as 1 minus QL over QH, and those can be heat rates or just heats. But let's see how this can be simplified for reversible heat engine cycles. This cycle, drawn on a PV diagram, would look like this, with two isothermal lines. Since there is no change in temperature between 1 and 2, and therefore no internal energy change, the work has to be the same as the heat. If the heat is equal to the work, which is equal to the integral of P dV, we can substitute P by nRT over V, with T being TH, and integrate. And we can do the exact same thing from 3 to 4, with T being TL. Now, if we remember what we said about adiabatic processes during the polytropic processes 10-minute lecture, link below, we said that P times V to the K is constant, with K being CP over CV. Using the ideal gas equation, it's easy to see that we can write two more of these relationships. P to the 1 minus K times T to the K, or the T times V to the K minus 1 are constant. If we use this last relation between states 2 and 3 and 4 and 1 of our Carnot cycle, we can divide the equations to get a relationship between the volumes. If we substitute log of V2 over V1 as log of V3 over V4, which from this equation is QL over nRTL, we get that QH over QL is equal to TH over TL. And this is what we wanted, the efficiency of the heat engine, at least for a reversible process, is equal to 1 minus TL over TH. This implies that we can increase the efficiency of a cycle if we have a really low temperature for the low temperature reservoir, or a really high temperature for the high temperature reservoir. And additionally, we know that this efficiency is theoretical, and that any real world, non-reversible cycle will have a maximum limit equal to this expression. Now finally, this is applicable to refrigeration cycles and heat pump cycles too. Remember that a refrigeration cycle was just the opposite of a heat engine. In the heat engine, we're taking energy in the form of heat from a high temperature reservoir and dumping some into a low temperature reservoir to extract work. In a refrigeration slash heat pump cycle, we use work to take energy in the form of heat from a low temperature reservoir and dump it in a high temperature reservoir. In terms of devices, the throttling device or expansion valve replaces the turbine, since we're not extracting work here. We call the boiler an evaporator, and we change the names between evaporator and condenser. Remember that these are still just heat exchangers. The names we give them really don't change the devices themselves. But as you can see, the cycle is basically the same, only reversed. And just like we studied in the previous lecture, link below, the heat pump is this same cycle run backwards. For the refrigeration cycle, we would have an isothermal compression in the condenser from 1 to 2 while rejecting heat, an adiabatic expansion at the expansion valve from 2 to 3, no work in or out, an isothermal expansion in the evaporator from 3 to 4 with heat coming in, and an adiabatic compression in the compressor from 4 to 1, ran by adding work. If we compare the two TV diagrams, we see that the direction is the complete opposite. Of course, you can work this out for a heat pump yourself. And finally, remember we used coefficients of performance as opposed to efficiency for these. Since the COP was what we want to obtain over the work in, the COP was QL over QH minus QL for refrigeration cycles, and QH over QH minus QL for heat pumps. 
for a Carnot cycle, since the ratio of the heats is the same as the ratio of the reservoir temperatures, we can write these in terms of temperatures. Let's look at an extremely easy example where we use what we learned here today. And if you want to check out more complex and much more interesting examples, make sure to check out the links in the description below. A Carnot heat engine receives 400 kilojoules of heat per cycle from a source of 700 degrees Celsius and rejects heat to a source at 20 degrees Celsius. What is the efficiency and what is the heat out per cycle? Well, we learned today that the efficiency of a heat engine, which used to be 1 minus QL over QH, can be written in terms of TL and TH when it's a reversible heat engine or a Carnot heat engine. Since we have the temperatures, we substitute their values and always, always remember to substitute temperature values in Kelvin because that is the absolute temperature, not a shifted one like Celsius is. And we find the efficiency to be 69.9%. And since this is still equal to the efficiency in terms of heats, we solve for the heat out, our second question here, and substitute the heat in of 400 kilojoules to find that the heat out is 120.5 kilojoules. Even if it's not part of the questions, we could easily calculate the work that this reversible heat engine produces. It would be the difference between Q in and Q out, or W net being 279.5 kilojoules per cycle. Like I said, if you want to check out more complex and interesting examples on the Carnot cycles topic, make sure to check out the links in the description of this video. Thanks for watching.